Hello, good day, bonjour. Uh, my name is Bobby Mitchell. I'm a concert pianist, and I'm here today at the Royal Conservatoire in Brussels. Uh, welcome those of you here in the audience, and for those of you who are watching through the live stream, uh, welcome to the Royal Conservatoire. I will talk about inner voices today. That's the name of the lecture I've chosen to give. Uh, this lecture is in honor of uh, a great pianist, composer, and friend of mine uh, whose name was Frederick Jevsky. And when I wrote the abstract uh, to give this lecture a year and a half ago, Frederick uh, was living here in Brussels, and I was hoping that he would come and listen to me talk and ask a lot of mean questions at the end, which was his uh, kind of his nature, but in a in a curious curious and open-minded way. So please ask uh, questions of any kind once I'm finished uh, giving the lecture. So, in Frederick's honor, I will talk about inner voices, and um, I will use a text that he wrote to construct today's lecture. Uh, we are here in the context of the Schumann Day at the re during the research week at the Royal Conservatoire, and my research here is uh, based on experimenting with the music of Robert Schumann. So I will use Frederick as an inspiration, but I'll also mainly be playing examples from the Romantic repertoire, specifically uh, music by Robert Schumann. So let's get started. Uh, I quote Frederick Jevsky, who wrote in 1994 after he gave a lecture called Inner Voices. As a general figure of speech, the inner voice is that of the mind or conscience. It may be identified with a personal guardian spirit, as in the case of Socrates' daemon, or the genius of Roman religion. It usually speaks in words, but it may also make its presence known through a kind of feeling or emotion, or as music. Frederick already interrupt, interrupts himself in this text with the first footnote, which I find too interesting not to read aloud to you as well. So this is a footnote regarding the last sentence. Uh, in the traditional culture of the Sioux, a Native American tribe that occupied the Dakota region of what is now the United States and Canada. In the traditional culture of the Sioux, the young initiate warrior spends a few weeks alone in the wilderness, during which time he learns his own private chant, which may not be revealed to others, and which may be sung only in times of danger, when his guardian spirit will come to his assistance. Back to Frederick's main text. There may be more than one inner voice. For example, in Genesis chapter 4, line 10, Yahweh, presumably an inner voice himself, says to Cain, listen to the voice of your brother's blood crying out to me from the ground. Inner voices may also be in conflict with one another. They may, they may be a gray area between conscious and unconscious, a way through which these parts of the mind communicate with each other, pre-symbolic, not yet language, but no longer dream. That's Frederick Zhevsky talking about what he calls a general figure of speech, the inner voice. Uh, he immediately continues in the text by talking about what the inner voice is in terms of the technical term in music. And because I'm a pianist, uh, this may have more importance during today's lecture, so I'll continue reading now. This is Frederick talking about the second meaning of inner voice. As a technical term in music, the inner voices are those situated the, between the highest and lowest in polyphonic writing, the tenor and alto voices, for example, in a four-part chorale. They may be heard less clearly than the soprano and bass parts and in their melodic profile may be less interesting than these. Their function often limited to that of harmonic support for the principal line. This hierarchical ranking of voices varies greatly throughout the history of polyphony. 
the style of the Renaissance, in which all voices receive more or less equal treatment, could be said to be more democratic than that of the classical period, in which the outer voices, and especially the highest one, are favored. But on the other hand, the partly hidden quality of the inner voices in later styles could be considered as adding a dimension of depth to music which earlier strict polyphony did not have. The fact that we do not hear everything clearly in the inner lines of a composition does not mean that these are less important. On the contrary, the semi-concealed motion of a line may express a sense of shadow and mystery central to the music. There are many examples of this technique in the Romantic period. Those were Frederick Zhevsky's words about inner voices. And he conveniently um, ends that paragraph talking about the Romantic period. So I'll now shift to Romantic music. And let's focus on what the inner voice can mean or how it can sound in the Romantic period. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the article that I just quoted from, um, what I'll be talking about now diverges from the article at this point, because Frederick, understandably so for um, a prolific composer, focuses very much on the general sense of the inner voice, the first meaning that I had just discussed. Uh, and specifically, he talks a lot about um, how the composer is essentially professionally engaged to hear the inner voices that are in one's mind and to somehow translate all of that mystery into music notation. Uh, the article is fascinating and it's something that I can't really speak to great expertise about, uh, not being a prolific composer myself. I do compose, so I do understand the gist of what he's talking about. Uh, but I focus on playing the piano, at least at this stage in my musical career, and therefore, Frederick's article inspired me to not ask the same questions that he asks as a composer, but rather as a pianist to ask a hypothetical question, and namely, what this first sense of inner voice might have to do with the second sense. What might these inner voices that we have in our mind have to do with the inner voices in the score? That's the hypothetical question uh, that I want to use today as a launch pad. And I think in order to even come towards an answer to that question, uh, we need to look at some inner voices in the score. Let's do that first with Schumann. And I'll also show one example from Frederick's music as well. Schumann also was clearly interested in the inner voice. Uh, rather than go straight to Schumann's journalism, although he was a prolific writer, like Frederick, actually, uh, I'll go into Schumann's scores, and uh, we'll start from there. In the Humoresque, a piece for piano, Schumann introduces what he writes, what he calls an inner Stimme, which is German for inner voice, uh, in the middle of a piano score. It's on about the eighth or the ninth page after you've just read typical piano music where the right hand is written on one line and the left hand on the lower line. And at a certain point, uh, Schumann continues to write piano music, right hand, left hand. Uh, and in between those lines, he notates what he calls an inner Stimme, an inner voice. So I'll play the piano music first, as if the inner voice doesn't exist. piano music, as you expect from Schumann. Uh, I want you to hear the inner voice that he notates, although I can't take the assumption that he wants you to hear it. it. Nobody really knows what he's intending by including it in the score. 
Uh, but right now, for the purposes of this lecture, of course, I want you to hear it. And because I don't have a good singing voice, I brought my second favorite instrument with me. So the inner voice, uh, I'll be playing on the kazoo. And I'll play the piano score as I just did now. <laughs> It's remarkably unremarkable, the inner voice. In fact, it wavers between notes that don't extend any larger than a fourth, an interval of a fourth. So there's just D, C, E. And amidst all of this piano playing, <laughs> There's this somewhat mundane inner voice that he insisted on uh, notating. Uh, Schumann, of course, loved puzzles. And uh, this is certainly a puzzle. It continues, like I already played, by uh, remaining within that pitch range. It goes down just a little bit further. So I'll play the second half now again. <laughs> So, without coming to any sort of conclusion, I'll now uh, move on to another example. It was very convenient that Marco Montivani this morning mentioned this example uh, as well. This is from the end of the Novelletten, which is middle period Schumann, when he was starting to write what I have started to consider to be avant-garde piano music. And uh, for those of you who know the Novelletten, uh, I see it as kind of a cycle that should be played as one piece, which takes about 42, 43 minutes. And so this example comes at the end of, of that time frame. This comes at a maybe minute 39 or 40, so very much towards the end of the piece. And uh, Marco pointed out this morning that this is a quote. This is a direct citation from Schumann's wife's uh, Nocturne. Clara Wieck was um, a well-known pianist and Schumann was in love with her and um, they married. And this is a quote from her, Nocturne, and Schumann here calls it Stimme aus der Ferne, uh, voice from the distance. And as you'll see when I play it now, it's actually technically not an inner voice, but uh, Schumann makes it clear that you don't play it as though it's the most present voice in the score. It's supposed to be heard as though it's from a distance. So in the midst of this ostinato material, Like I was saying, in the midst of this ostinato material, this repetitive music, uh, this voice from the distance emerges over top. And I did my best to honor Schumann's score in the sense that I 
tried to play the, this voice almost inaudibly. A classically trained pianist, of course, dealing with a more normal composer than Schumann, would play it audibly. <laughs> a sensible way of playing music because the melody is um, traditionally the most important. I don't think that's his intention and uh, the question here is whether this is a kind of s cinematographic effect. Is the voice literally just inaudible because it's far away and the piano music is close by? Is there some other layer of meaning here in terms of why the top voice uh, is kind of treated as though it's an inner voice and the inner voices are treated as though they are the, traditionally speaking, the outer voices, the ones that are traditionally the most audible. I don't think those are questions that we can answer right now and I don't even know if those questions are answerable but I do think they're important to ask. Especially when um, dealing with playing Schumann uh, without considering these things, uh, I think you miss something that he's trying to tell us with the music. And after all, it's also fun to propose hypothetical questions uh, that may theoretically be something that music is, is for. I'll move on to the third example, which is an example I wanted to show because uh, Frederick says explicitly after describing musical inner voices um, that in the Romantic period there are many examples of the technique where a semi-concealed motion of a line, usually an inner voice, uh, highlights or colors the entire passage. Uh, so in order to show an example of that I'll play the first piece from the Waldszene and the scenes from uh, the forest scenes. I think would be the English translation. And uh, this is the first piece from the forest scenes and uh, it's called Entrance into the Forest. So this is the listener or the pianist or whoever uh, entering the forest. <laughs> Just now, in the music, in my opinion, uh, something went wrong in the forest, or at least something changed drastically. The contrast between this kind of, that kind of music, or between, for example, this, quite explicit and uh, pleasant music. Uh, the contrast between that and is large. There's a large contrast, in my opinion. So I'll play this um, strange music now without the inner voice. I'll warm up to it just a little bit by starting here. <laughs> And now I'll play it with the uh, missing tenor voice that I just left out.
So this uh, also quite basic tenor line. Colors, the entire passage. It also serves the function now to lead us back to the I especially like this example because it's explicit. It's clear how the tenor voice completely affects uh, the whole ambiance, the whole feeling of the passage. And that Schumann also has these kind of different musics that come right next to each other and on top of each other. Uh, it's very effective. It's a technique that I think he does well. It could be one of the main reasons why we focus on um, Schumann nowadays, many, many centuries, or a couple of centuries later. I'd like to uh, show one example of Frederick's music instead of just quoting his words because he was a prolific composer. And um, for that I chose to show you this passage from a piece that he wrote in 2000 12 or 13, I think the whole cycle was written between 2012 and 2014, and it's called Dreams. So a good title to consider inner voices. Uh, this is a piece from Dreams called Ruins, and uh, the, the piece is essentially what is traditionally called a passacaglia. So there's a bass line that drives the entirety of the piece. And uh, towards the end of the piece, the music builds up to a very virtuosic climax where the bass <laughs> nevertheless continues uh, showing that kind of stability and force. So I'll play that passage now with uh, a florid uh, right hand part which is pretty much the highlight of the virtuosity in this piece, and then you'll see when the texture changes. I won't tell you what happens first. I'd like to play it for you first. So first there's the florid right hand with the bass, and then there's the texture change. <laughs> stop there um, because I want to focus on something specific that happened and uh, parallel to demonstrating this again I have a question for any pianist in the audience um, live or on the stream because I'm curious if you could help me fill in any knowledge that I may be missing in terms of pianistic uh, showmanship or technical techniques uh, so when I demonstrate this further, I would like you to consider if this exists in the repertoire before, and if, do, if it does, then please tell me, because I'm looking for another example of this kind of technical tool, this kind of craftsmanship in terms of the constructing the score. So after the florid right hand and the bass, which is a simple texture, Uh, seven bars later, the right hand plays long. Long tones, or legato tones, however you want to describe them, and that's two voices. 
as I think you can hear. So one voice is actually just a chromatic scale, and the other voice is uh, related to the bass. So the combination of those sounds like this. Meanwhile, the left hand plays two more voices, which are played staccato, and there's a technical reason why. Beca it's very hard to not play wrong notes in this passage, but I'll do that again. There's a chromatic scale in, in the bass. Actually, the summation of all of this um, highlights, again, the inner voices, not the outer voices. And that has to do with the articulation, which you'll hear now. So one last time, because it's kind of a new um, sound world. So that's music by Frederick Zhevsky, and again, um, I feel that this uh, must have something to do with his interest in inner voices. Uh, I also wonder if this is not a kind of innovative way of writing for the piano, hence my question to you pianists. So any, any context in terms of this kind of piano writing would interest me very much. I have uh, penultimate examples, so the second to last, the avant dernière, as I learned uh, in Brussels. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to give uh, this example a little bit of time because uh, Schumann was very, very interested in imitative counterpoints. Uh, he played the well tempered clavier, uh, which is music by Bach. Uh, he played it every day, I believe, or I mean, I can't prove that, but he writes about playing it regularly. And he wrote a lot of imitative counterpoint, and this example is from the late Fugetin, which is a piano piece, there are seven of them. And so, without talking too much, I'll play the theme, and then, as you'll hear, the theme returns uh, again and again, which is how a fugue, or a fugetta, which is a little fugue, that's how it works. And I'll point out when the theme uh, becomes a truly inner voice. At the beginning, the theme is alone, so it can't be inside because it's alone. Uh, then the theme has the counter subject, so they're both outer voices. And then the theme is an outer voice, and then it's an outer voice again. And only on the fifth statement of the theme is it an inner voice. And so I'll try to point that out at that point.
transition now of two bars with no theme. And now the inner, now the theme is in the inner voice in the tenor. the theme is back on the top in the soprano. So it's hard to stop playing such beautiful music, but I want to show this example. And uh, while looking through Schumann's music and thinking about inner voices at home, I came across this example and I wondered if it's coincidence that uh, this kind of semi-tragic music unfolds so slowly and when the theme becomes an inner voice, only at that point does the music shift to a major key. Something about uh, a total shift in the psychology in the, in the piece at that point. And in the meantime, the theme is in the inside, no longer on the outside. There's really nothing else to say about that except to um, ponder the existence of music and this kind of beautiful music and to enjoy playing it. Uh, but I wanted to show you that example. Before I uh, move towards the final musical example, which is how I'll end today's uh, talk. Because I'm a pianist, I like to finish with the music. I like to talk, I do enjoy talking but I like playing the piano, actually, uh, more. <laughs> the uh, concluding statements that one could make about inner voices would be sort of um, vague at best and uh, hypothetical, I suppose. Uh, Frederick makes some interesting concluding statements after he dwells on what the composer's true job is, which, as he describes it, entails um, spending a lot of time listening to one's own inner voices and uh, translating those into music notation somehow, grabbing onto something which is completely ephemeral and absolutely abstract and channeling it into a tool that others can actually use. Uh, he makes some very entertaining claims about um, how this impacts society and the composer's role in society, and he even makes an entertaining uh, hypothetical question about the health impacts, for example, of smoking tobacco, and that the health impacts of dealing with music on this level are unknown. <laughs> uh, it's true that we can't know uh, it's what health impacts music has on us. I'm sure that there are positive ones. I've been playing music my whole life. There may also be negative ones but it's something that we just don't know. It's something that science has not approached as far as I know. Let me read to you the last statement that uh, Frederick makes. Um, of course, I, oh yeah, it was on. As I reach the end of this lecture, I have the feeling that I have said nothing that has not been said before. But this all too familiar subject matter can be seen in a new light. We are living through an extraordinary turn in the evolution of the species in which forms of order and disorder compete for dominance. We need new forms, but little can be said about them except that they are everywhere. They can be found by fishing around in the garbage. We can find new forms if we simply listen to the world as it is, without trying to force it to conform to abstract models. This disorderliness of the world and that of our own minds will give us these forms if we allow them to flow through our pens. And in response to Frederick, possibly also through our piano playing. 
To do this, we must find ways of momentarily blocking the mechanisms of mind which normally impede this flow. Rational systems of the kind used in most composed music of this century, although they may be necessary in other contexts, are not useful here. A more spontaneous form of writing, more receptive to the non sequiturs of everyday life, more like this life in its structure, is needed. By liberating the inner voices, by giving them the same value as the outer ones, music could vastly expand the resources of its language. I considered for a long time what liberating inner voices could mean on any sort of abstract or concrete level and decided that because I'm a pianist and I'm interested in very highly contrapuntal music, specifically uh, music of Robert Schumann, uh, I want to let this concept of liberating the inner voices and letting them take charge drive the way I now play a piece for you. And I won't make any claims that this is the way I would play the piece uh, in any kind of concert scenario. On the other hand, we make music in all sorts of contexts and um, in the past music was played in salons, was played in great concert halls. Today I'm giving a lecture and playing music. So I do think it's valid to unlock the performance practice habits that we have and try to play music differently. That's what I want to do now for you. And to do this, I'm, um, I've taken Schumann's Concert Sans Orchestre, which in English is the Concerto Without Orchestra. It's also, a, he also called it a piano sonata. And I'll take the last movement of that piece, which is a grand finale uh, in F minor. And for now, I'll ignore that Schumann writes presto possibile, prestissimo possibile. I'll ignore that for now because actually what I want to do is take this textural music that often uh, unfolds in six, seven voice counterpoint, and I want to play it slowly at first and collectively listen to what's on the inside. So uh, that takes time in my opinion, and so I'll take some time with the score and play it that way at first. And because it's a movement of a sonata, it has repetition which is general, it's a general trait of classical music to include repetition. So I'm saying that because uh, once I sort of reach the middle of the piece and the piece starts to repeat itself, I may shift into more of a concert mode, but I can't predict that now. At some point, I, w I think I'll let the, m the piece return to its kind of moto perpetuo that it wants, uh, so that the performance isn't completely didactic. But I think this should be an interesting uh, listening experience for everyone, especially because as a pianist, I notice that I am lucky to spend a lot of time with the intricacies of these complicated scores. And I spend hours not only practicing them, but learning to you know, play all these details also by memory and physically navigate them to choreograph the whole experience. And so I think this will be an interesting listening, ex listening experience for you. Uh, it may invite you into some of that working space. And I'm aware that I'm uh, ignoring some of Schumann's intentions at the beginning, but we'll see how it unfolds. So I'll say thank you now, and I'll perform this uh, prestissimo possibile, but kind of slowly. And afterwards, I'll be very happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you.
questions without the microphone, or should I? Thank you for your uh, attention. that you've made, and it's something I've considered a little bit playing Schumann leader. Uh, it's also something that dawned on me first uh, a long time ago when I um, first listened to Wagner, for example, The Ring, because I got the sense that some of the lines that Wagner writes are very basic compared to what the orchestra is doing. And that's a trick he may have learned from Schumann, because Schumann also writes uh, piano accompaniments that have very melodic materials, and the, s and the singer does melodic singing as well, but in some cases what the, the top voice in the piano is, would, I would rate the more interesting one from an objective perspective, and the singer is doing a kind of uh, but then it's a kind of theatrical trick, or it's a kind of irony maybe to have the singer present the less interesting voice. It's a kind of, maybe a kind of Schattenspiel, maybe a kind of, um, I don't know, layering of, of meaning or or just a game, also. Schumann enjoyed contrapuntal uh, writing so much that it, you see it uh, in his score. It can be a kind of game. As uh, actually this morning, as Andrea mentioned in the fantasy, there's he called it a game. What Schumann's doing, which is the same melody, just micro canonically presented three times. So bum 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 bum. So I think that's an ex excellent point you're making that the, these kind of layers certainly affect the way he wrote songs and possibly also the way we could um, approach the performance of them. So thank you. Marc Henri. There are some uh, pianists, as you know, like uh, Glenn Gould or Keith Jarrett, who do a sort of uh, 
singing while they are playing, even if it's completely unrelated to the music. <laughs> Would you consider that an inner voice or just uh, some way of expressing their emotion? I think that's why I took off the headset before I, <laughs> <laughs> before I played. Did you do it too? I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's a pianist habit. I think, uh, and that's an excellent question. Who am I to determine whether or not that's an inner voice or, or if it's not? I mean, who am I to say that that's not a kind of inner voice? We can, it is clear that it's not in the score. <laughs> so it's not, <laughs> it's not possibly, uh, we didn't inherit that intention from, from the composer through the score. But is that an inner voice in terms of the performance practice, in terms of Glenn Gould's performance practice? Why not? You can hear it in the, all their uh, recordings. So does it ruin the recording or does it add something to it? That's a, 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 a question that nobody can answer, but um, I mean, except to say that if you like it, you like it. I, and it clearly, these are big artists, so I think they are aware of what they're doing. So they may be doing it on purpose. Thank you. Remember, in De Profundis, uh, Frederick writes in two parts, two of the solo parts, the polyphonic part, in uh, uh, E flat major and the very fast part, that you can hum and, and <laughs> sing as a pianist uh, practicing. So yeah, it's Glenn good. Gustav, you remember that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't recognize him, Stefan. Behind it. Yeah. yeah, that's Frederick is the only composer I know who actually intention, intentions this by putting it in the score <laughs> as a parody to, I mean, as a parody to Glenn Gould. And of course, there is whistling and uh, noises that are also part of the music. True. Yeah. What element do those have in terms of theatricality is clear, but in terms of representing some sort of inner voice? Who knows? Who knows? Are there any other questions? Yes, yeah. If I can go back to the Schumann, thank you for this wonderful performance, um, especially in the conservatoire, where some things are expected in exams and uh, all things you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, yes. I think it was a major influence on me because uh, the difference in technology is astounding. Uh, Schumann didn't know this kind of piano which is cross-strung and filled with metal. And so when you play on the older pianos, uh, the inner voices are already clear and you don't have to, you don't have to worry that they're uh, way too overbearing. You don't have to play the melody way louder than the inner voices, it's just not a problem. And so in a way you don't even have to take the amount of time uh, that I possibly took now to try to hear an inner voice. On the Steinway, it also almost demands more time to listen and react upon hearing an inner voice. On the period instrument, it's a, a little bit more transparent and audible, all the layers. So I think it's a big influence on, on also the way I play the piano in general. Yeah. Stefan. So have you tried to play Jesse on the period instrument? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually I did. I played, um, how, how I played, play? I actually was, I had a very nice concert engagement and I played at Chris Mana's uh, warehouse in Reise Leiden. And uh, it was a five octave piano and I was playing Haydn and I played some of the road oh. on that <laughs> piano. But it was just a piece that involved hitting the piano and speaking. <laughs> <laughs> But it worked out, it was fine. Yeah. I didn't even touch the keys. <laughs> I'm sure there's time for one more question. I like questions. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And